We're glad you're here today. And uh, for those of you who may be here or joining us online for the first time, we just want to welcome you to Valley View. You can see we're a friendly place, and uh, uh, we're glad that you're here today. Our theme this year is move. Uh, our, our goal is this year is moving closer to Jesus, moving to, to more into our community, and moving to impact the world around us. And so uh, to help us reach our goals, one of the things we're doing is studying together the life and the teachings of Jesus. We're reading through the four Gospels. And this week's reading brought us to John chapter 3. Uh, it's an amazing chapter, so I'd like you to open your Bible or your phone app to John chapter 3. There's a lavender insert in your bulletin today, or you can also access that online. The back of the bulletin tells you how to do that. But a few years ago, uh, George Gallup, the pollster, announced the results of a new poll uh, regarding Christianity in America. And a reporter asked Mr. Gallup about his own personal faith. And Gallup said, well, I'm a practicing Christian. And then the reporter said, are you a born-again Christian? And Gallup hesitated. Wasn't sure what to say. And he said, well, I don't remember seeing a bolt of lightning or anything. And you know, many people today don't understand what it means to be born again. People use that term and they abuse that term. God never indicates that the new birth is going to be accompanied by lights and bells and whistles, uh, tingles down our spine. So we needn't feel uneasy because we never saw a bolt of lightning. Like George Gallup seemed to be uneasy about that. The new birth can be a very gentle, very peaceful experience. And so but, but the thing is, Jesus says here in John chapter 3 and verse 3, a person must be born again. So we need to understand that. We must make that life-changing once and for all decision down at the very deepest level of our being or we'll never experience the fullness of the life that God wants us to have and that we long for. We are born again when we simply say yes to Jesus. Yes, I will make you the king of my life. Yes, I will submit my heart to be your throne. Yes, I will allow you to be my Lord and my God. Now, for those, of, uh, those who are of a more emotional nature, there may be a very profound experience. For those who are more rational in nature, there may not be. But the new birth is not founded upon our feelings. It's founded upon the faithfulness of God and His Word. When we commit our lives, all that we are, all that we have, to Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords, we will become God's new creation. Now, here in John 3, it's a very familiar story for those of you who have read the Bible. Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, a leader of the Pharisees, comes to Jesus for a theological discussion. Nicodemus was steeped in a religion that emphasized morality, that taught that by doing enough good and by keeping enough rules, the right rules, and following the proper rituals, a person could please God. It was a religion that stressed the externals, but Jesus cut right to the heart of the matter, which is a matter of the heart. The externals are fine as long as they spring from the internal, from our heart. But for most of the Pharisees, there was only the external. It's the heart that has to be touched and transformed by God. Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And immediately in verse 4, Nicodemus asked a question for clarification. How can a man be born when he is old? He can't enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? It's difficult to determine whether Nicodemus asked this question because he really couldn't understand what Jesus meant and he needed uh, further instruction, or if he asks it as a smokescreen because he understood all too well what Jesus meant and he didn't want to accept it. See, there are, there are two kinds of misunderstanding. There's the misunderstanding of, of one who really is seeking to learn, but they just misunderstand because they've not yet reached that stage of knowledge by which they can grasp certain things. The Bible speaks of babies in the faith who need milk 
and not solid food because they're not accustomed to the word. There's a genuine inability to understand spiritual things due to a lack of knowledge sometimes. But there's a second kind of misunderstanding. And you parents will know this very well. It's the misunderstanding that comes from an unwillingness to understand and a refusal to see. If you have kids, you're aware of that. They can be so bright and so absolutely dense when it comes to understanding something they don't want to do. My kids never could quite get what it meant to carry out the trash. And Jesus said that same thing is true spiritually. He promised whoever is willing to do God's will, he shall know of the teaching. But when one's not willing to know God's will, he's going to have very little understanding because he doesn't want to understand it. A person can deliberately shut their mind to the truth that they do not wish to see. And I think Nicodemus could have been like that to some extent. Jesus indicates in verse 10, if you look down there, he should have been able to understand what Christ was saying. For one thing, the Old Testament prophets, while they did not use this phrase, born again, they often speak about God giving people a new heart, giving people a new spirit, making a person a new creation. And Nicodemus should have known those prophets. In addition to those scriptures, which Nicodemus should have known as a rabbi, there was a common practice of that day which should have enabled him to understand exactly what Jesus meant. Because whenever a Gentile, a non-Jew, became a convert to Judaism, he, he, he prayed, he sacrificed, and he was baptized. And the rabbis called him a newborn child of Israel. But see, there's no way that Nicodemus, being a true-born Israelite, a member of the Sanhedrin, the, the Jewish Supreme Council, a renowned rabbi, and a Pharisee, the strictest group of, of the Jews, there's no way that he was going to apply that born-again phrase to himself. The Gentiles, they needed to be born again. They needed to be newborn, but not a leader of the Jews. So rather than understanding that inner transformation that Jesus was intending, he takes Christ's words absolutely literally. And he asks what I think is an absurd question. I mean, the Jewish leaders frequently understood Jesus literally when Jesus was speaking figuratively. Uh, you already read chapter 2 of John where he spoke about the temple of his body and they took that literally of the temple that was there in Jerusalem. See, there are none so blind as those who just refuse to see. Maybe Nicodemus' question reflected a certain longing in his own heart. Anthropologists tell us that man's greatest dream is the desire to start all over again. You've heard people say, man, if I could only have another chance, if I could only get a do-over, if I only knew then what I knew now, I'd get it right. Wrong. You would never get it right. The problem with humanity is not that we don't know enough. It's what we are. That's what leads us to do the things that are wrong. Mark Twain once said, it's not what I don't know about the Bible that bothers me. It's what I do know. See, it, 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 he was not doing what he knew. And that's the real problem. Most people know what's right, but they don't do what's right. And the reason is because there's something wrong about who they are. And it's true of every single one of you. It's true of all of us. The problem is we belong to a fallen race. It's who we are that is wrong. And that's exactly why Jesus said that a person must be born again. It is our heart. It is our very nature that has to be changed. And only God can do that. In verses 5 to 8, Jesus offers further insight into this new birth. But it's not a very a satisfying explanation, at least for Nicodemus. First of all, Jesus answers that immediate absurd question that he asked. In verse 5, he talks about how an adult could be born again. And I want you to notice that Jesus prefaces his words with that special phrase he used so often to emphasize a very solemn truth. Anytime he said, truly, truly, I say to you, that, that's his sign that he wants you to prick up your ears because what he's going to say is very, very important. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. 
Jesus tries to help Nicodemus see the spiritual side of what he wanted to take so literally. And Jesus is very practical here, almost as if he was saying, okay, now listen, Nicodemus, Nicodemus, here's how being born again works. He's actually answering a question that is asked again and again uh, in the book of Acts. What must I do? How can I be born again? How can I receive what you're offering me? Or as we talked about at the very beginning of the sermon, how can I say yes to Jesus? Jesus says that to be born again, you must be born of the water and the Spirit. And I believe it's clear, both from the context and from, from the historical circumstances, that the term water here refers to Christian baptism. When a Gentile was baptized, the rabbi said he was a newborn child, and Nicodemus was a rabbi. He was familiar with what it meant to be born of the water, to become a newborn child of Israel. And keep in mind, as you read in John chapter 1, John's baptism was the sensation of the nation at this time. Everybody was talking about it. And many, it says they were flocking to him to be baptized. The meaning of John's baptism was the central theological issue of the day. And a delegation of the Jewish leaders were sent out to John at the Jordan River to discuss that issue with him, to find out what that baptism was all about. And already the waters of baptism have been connected to the Holy Spirit. A couple weeks ago, you were reading about Jesus being baptized. He was immersed by John the baptizer. And and he went down into the water. And when he came up out of that water, the heavens opened. And the Holy Spirit came down, you remember, in the form of a dove and remained on Christ. So the Holy Spirit and baptism has already been connected in the Scripture. And then when we keep in mind that John's Gospel was one of the last books written in the New Testament Scriptures, written about 85 A.D., we understand why John saw no need to explain this phrase. See, a lot of times in John's Gospel, we'll see in a few minutes how he does this, but John will put a parenthesis in there after something Jesus said, and he'll explain the phrase. He doesn't see any need to explain the phrase born again because people had seen it again and again and again. They frequently heard of the waters of baptism and the Holy Spirit mentioned together the very first time the Gospel was ever preached. After the new covenant was in effect, after Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and ascension to heaven, Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, and he preached the gospel for the first time, and he said, let each of you repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was going to come and live in their lives for the first time ever in the new covenant. Paul told the Corinthians, by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. To Titus, he wrote, that he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. And when Paul explained the new birth to the Romans, he said, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? We've been baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him in that watery grave through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might be raised to walk in newness of life. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be united with him in the likeness of his resurrection. The first century audience of John's gospel These people that he was speaking to would readily understand being born of water and the Spirit. As we look at the history book of the early church, as we look at at the book of Acts, we're going to be studying that the second half of this year. We find that the early church spread, Christianity spread throughout the Roman world. Thousands and thousands of men and women were born again into the kingdom of God. And in every single detailed account that's given in the book of Acts, There were three steps that every single person took. Number one, they declared their faith in Christ. Number two, they repented of their sins. They confessed the error of their way. They committed from going their way to going God's way. And then they sealed that commitment by being buried in the waters of baptism. Paul says, when we were buried with Christ in baptism, we clothe ourselves in Christ. Jesus, by His Spirit, comes to live in us, 
And if anyone is in Christ, the Bible says, they are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Now, if these early Christians, the people reading this letter for the first time, saw people being immersed in the waters of baptism every single time somebody was converted to Christ, they would certainly understand what Jesus meant by being born of the water and the Spirit. And it's very clear that the Apostle Paul expected the early disciples to understand the connection between baptism and the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit. Because in Acts 19, he came upon 12 men outside the city of Ephesus. And they appeared to be believers. And he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, we never even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. And so Paul said, then what kind of baptism did you receive? See, if you received Christian baptism, you would have received the Holy Spirit. And they explained to him, they only knew the preparatory baptism of John the baptizer. And so that was just a preparatory baptism. You couldn't be baptized into Christ before Christ himself had died. You couldn't be buried with him in his death and resurrection until he himself had been, you know, died and and been buried and rose again. And so John's baptism and the baptism of Jesus' disciples early on throughout the Gospels, those are preparatory baptisms. And so immediately Paul baptized them into Christ. They received the forgiveness of their sins. They received the gift of the Holy Spirit living within them. And then Paul laid his hands on them and gave them some spiritual gifts as well. What's unfortunate today is many people have relegated baptism to a mere ceremony. It's a ceremony, kind of like a wedding ceremony, you know. But in the New Testament, it was no ceremony. It was always intimately connected with the initial confession of a person's faith in Christ, their acceptance of him, their making him their Lord and their king. Paul tells the Colossians, when you were baptized, you were buried with Christ, and you were raised up with him through your faith in God's power that was shown when he raised him from the dead. Baptism is not a ceremony. It has to be intimately connected with faith and the powerful working of God upon our hearts and our minds. And if you note it in Acts 19, baptism was not something that we do. It's not a work. You cannot baptize. You know, it's, it is, you have to be baptized. It's something we receive. It is the most amazing act of surrender that we submit to by allowing ourselves to be buried in Christ in that water and then raised to life by the power of God's regenerating work in us. It's something we just completely submit to. We are absolutely submissive. It's a great, uh, it's a great lesson of our submission to Christ as Lord. And it's not the water that changes anyone. There is no magic in that water, in that baptistry. Comes out of the same uh, pool of water you drink the water from out the water fountain. It's the Holy Spirit that produces the transformation in us as we submit to God, as we surrender to Him in faithful obedience. Peter emphasizes this when he says in his letter, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God. For a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If our baptism is not the appeal to God from our heart of faith, he will not respond. There, I've run into many, many parents who superstitiously think that if they baptize their babies, they will assure the children of entrance into God's, God's, the kingdom of heaven or, or into God's heaven. And if they're baptized, the parents... They they feel like they're guaranteed admittance into heaven. That is rank superstition. The only change water makes, like Peter says, is you get a little dirt washed off of you. It doesn't make you any different in God's eyes. You could be baptized so many times that every fish in the lake knows your name, but it won't help you spiritually. That's why we have booklets that parents can use to teach their kids the real meaning of baptism as an act of faith and an act of surrender to Jesus. We have parents' guides that go along with it. You can pick them up at the children's desk. You can pick them up at the, uh, you can can, uh, download them online. 
But see, in the Bible, you've got to understand baptism is never, ever disconnected from faith and repentance, from a confession of our failure to do God's will and a decision to die to that old way of life, to be buried in that water of baptism and then raised from those waters to walk in newness of life with a new slate, a new spirit, and a new power. I've been teaching the Bible for 45 years, and I want to tell you that the one thing that keeps people from being born again is the very same thing that kept Nicodemus. They do not want to admit their need. They do not want to admit that there's something basically wrong with them. Most people still cling to the idea that there's something good about them, that God ought to accept. And if they do more good than they do bad, then he ought to let them into heaven. I don't think there's anything that's been more destructive in all of Christianity than that idea. Listen, you can never, ever be good enough. You cannot earn or deserve God's favor. If you could, then Jesus didn't need to go to the cross. He didn't need to suffer like he did. If you could be good enough, repentance is necessary. Jesus said, unless you repent, you will perish. He said it two times in a row in two verses. You, you and I desperately need a Savior. And that's what baptism acknowledges. It is a prayer, Peter says. It is an appeal to God for his cleansing. It's the way we say, yes, Jesus, I want what you have to offer. In fact, it's the only sinner's prayer you'll ever find in the Bible is baptism. Nobody was ever asked to pray a prayer to ask God into their hearts. In fact, Paul was praying for three days and repenting after he saw Jesus on the road. And Jesus sent Ananias to him and said, why do you wait? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. That's the way God has told us that we say yes to him. That's what baptism acknowledges. It's an appeal to God for his cleansing, for his transforming touch. And that's why most of the Jewish leaders did not submit to John's baptism. They would not admit their need. And that's exactly why Jesus told Nicodemus, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. In verses 6 and 7, Jesus explains why this new birth is necessary. In verse 6, he points out this great chasm between the nature of mankind, the physical, and the nature of God, the spiritual. There's this clear, radical difference. The Bible, he says right there in John 3, 6, human life comes from human parents, but spiritual life comes from the Spirit. Sin has pervaded our race. And sinful human beings always produce sinful human beings. Now, we don't like this. Like I said a while ago, we like to think there's something good in us. This may, see, and here's the thing. Most people live much of their lives trying to improve the sinful nature. They want behavior modification. That's not what God wants at all. You, you, you try to improve the sinful human nature and... It might be better for the people you're around. You won't be so nasty to them. And you might feel better about it yourself. But you know what? From God's point of view, uh, it has no impact at all. It's, it's a little bit like painting a pump that's over a well of bad water. All right, so you got this well. And water's foul in there. You can't drink it. And, and, and so you got this well, and you think, man, I want, that, I want that to look better. So you paint the well. Well, the well looks better, right? At least, or you paint the pump. Pump looks better, but still, it's bad water. It's not good. You can't drink it. You give it a gold handle. It stands out from all the other pumps around. But nothing that you can do to that pump will change the fact that the water below it cannot be drunk. It's no good. And if you are trying with an unchanged, fallen, fleshly nature to please God, you will never be able to do it. You must be born again. You must be given a new nature. The Bible says the mind of the flesh is hostile toward God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. Probably should read the one that's up here. It says it's not even able to do so. You cannot please God. And those who are in the flesh just can't. No embellishment 
is going to change the fact that the pump is over a bad well of water. End of story. Unless we are born again, we cannot please God. Now, you can reduce the will of God to the most tedious and detailed rules, just like Nicodemus and the Pharisees did. But you still won't be able to please the Lord. You can keep all those rules, but you won't be able to please Him. As you read in the first chapter of John, it is not through natural birth nor through human performance that we become children of God. And that must have really been tough for Nicodemus to hear because the Jews put a lot of emphasis on their physical pedigree and on human works. But Jesus says any person by himself is flesh and his power is limited to what the flesh can do. By himself he cannot be anything other than defeated and frustrated. And we all know that only too well. It's been the universal fact of human experience. We've all experienced that. But the very essence of the Spirit is the power and life which are beyond human power and beyond human life. And when the Spirit takes possession of us, the Spirit does what only the Spirit can do. And the defeated life of human nature becomes the triumphant, victorious life of God. And I know that for a fact. It's what happened to me. It's what God did in me. And He changed my life. And He redeemed me. And He set me free from the bondage of sin and habits that were destroying me. (coughs) and hurting me. The new birth requires divine intervention by the Spirit of God. Now, some of you go to class that Marty Bolt teaches, and I've known Marty's dad for years and years, and his dad's a herpetologist, and I used to love to go over there and watch him. He had his whole basement filled with snakes, and I used to go over there and watch him as he dropped the mice, when he was feeding them, he dropped the mice into the cage. It's just amazing. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but a guy dropped a mouse into the the bed of sawdust in that, in that terrarium. And the mouse realized the danger when he saw that snake. So he started with his feet doing this, and he covered that snake completely up in sawdust. And then the mouse went over and sat in the corner, probably so proud that he had brilliantly solved his problem. But he didn't realize that the snake only had his eyes shut because he was saying grace for his dinner. That mouse needed help from the outside. Only if the man reached his hand down into that terrarium and took that mouse out could he be saved. There was no other way. You and I are that mouse. No matter how hard we try to cover up our sinful nature, it's fool's work. Sin will eventually awake from its sleep, shake off its cover, and consume us. Were it not for the loving kindness of God, His saving grace, the regenerating work of His Spirit, which makes us new creatures with a new nature, sin would eat us alive. We've got to have help from the outside. In physical birth, we take on the the nature of our parents. In spiritual birth, we become partakers of the divine nature. His seed, God's seed, abides in us. His Spirit makes our heart His home. He is with us. And He's with us for one purpose, to transform us day by day into the very image and character of Jesus from one degree of glory to another. And that's what He wants to do in every single one of our lives if we'll just let Him be the God He is. In verse 7, Jesus says it should be obvious in light of all this that we must be born again. He tells Nicodemus, don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again, as if it was some surprise. You know the scriptures, Nicodemus. You should not be surprised that God desires a change of heart and inner transformation rather than just physical lineage and external acts. But Nicodemus was used to the idea of salvation by works, salvation by performance. So he's not too open to the idea that it's a gift from God that it can't be earned or deserved, and that its initial act is not even a work of man. It's an act that is performed upon man when he is passive and submissive in baptism, just like he has to be passive and submissive to God in the rest of his life. Jesus sensed Nicodemus, in Nicodemus, a, a deep hunger and an emptiness. I mean, here was a man who was really doing his level best to obey what he thought God wanted, and yet he had an empty and unsatisfied heart that led him to seek out Jesus by night and risk the displeasure of his peers to talk with Jesus about the kingdom of God. 
Sensing this, our Lord immediately puts him on the right track. I mean, basically he's saying, Nicodemus, you're wasting your time if you think you can enter the kingdom of God the way you are. By keeping rules and regulations by your own performance, you cannot do that. You must be born again. You notice the change there? Earlier it was one must be born again, and now he's speaking specifically to Nicodemus. You, Nicodemus, must make this decision to be born of the water and the Spirit. It's not a recommendation. It's a necessity. Now, one thing very, very important for us to understand about this whole conversation and teaching on the new birth to Nicodemus, it is prophetic. Neither Nicodemus or anyone else could have been born again at that moment because the Holy Spirit was not yet given. Prior to Jesus' death, people were still living under the old covenant. Did you know that? The Gospels that we're reading, those are the old, that, though, they, even though they're a part of the New Testament Scriptures, the, the entire Gospels are under the old covenant. Jesus is predicting life under the new covenant. No one could be baptized into his death or raised in the likeness of his resurrection until Jesus had died himself and been raised. Nor could they receive the Holy Spirit to dwell in their lives. The Holy Spirit worked upon people. The Holy Spirit would occasionally empower people. But the Holy Spirit did not live in people's lives in the Old Testament. It wasn't until the night before his death that Jesus even promised the coming of the Holy Spirit to dwell in people in John 14, 15, and 16. And John makes this very clear in chapter 7 when he quotes Jesus who says, He who believes in me from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. And here's that parenthesis that John explains. John explains, but this... He spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. It was after Jesus' ascension, after his new covenant had been ratified by the shedding of his blood, that the Holy Spirit came to indwell people with his regenerating power. And that's why in the first new covenant sermon in Acts 2, when the church was born on the day of Pentecost, Peter promised people that their sins would be forgiven and the Holy Spirit would come to live in them when they believed, when they repented, that is, turned away from their sin and turned to God, committed to him, and when they sealed that by being baptized in obedience to Christ. And on that day, 3,000 were immersed into Christ. And I hope that Nicodemus was one of those 3,000. Are we, like Nicodemus, guilty of trying to change the outside without letting Christ first change the inside? The heart of Christianity is a matter of the heart. Will you invite the Spirit of Jesus to come into your life by believing with all your heart in God, in Jesus, turning your life over to Him and sealing that commitment in the waters of baptism. If you will, note that in the next steps on your, on your uh, tear-off card in your bulletin. I will invite the Spirit of Jesus to come into my life. I'll say yes to Him by believing with all my heart, turning my life over to Him, and sealing that commitment in the waters of baptism. And if you're ready, we have the baptistry ready. I think you need to follow through with that today. If God has spoken to your heart, I think there's no better time when God speaks to your heart than do it when he's talking to you. That shows the, the submission. That shows the, the faith. That shows the kind of commitment that you're making to him. There's me, no better time to obey Jesus than now. No reason to ever put off doing what he asks us to do. If you've never made this commitment, this surrender to Jesus' Lordship, I would encourage you to do that right now, today. Um, we're going to have Robert outside that door. You can go out the back door, you can go out this door, but we're going to have him, and he can take you to the baptistry room, he can answer any questions you have, he can baptize you right now. We have hair dryers, we have robes, we have uh, towels, you don't need anything else, you won't leave here wet, you won't leave here, you know, in, in soaking pair of pants. Um, that you didn't have that opportunity, you know, if you were getting baptized by John the Baptist, you know, uh, or even by any of Jesus' disciples, but water's warm and it's ready. If God's spoken to your heart, if you've never done this, do it today. Just follow Jesus. Just be obedient to him. Maybe you've been a believer for years, just like those guys in Ephesus, but they, they just didn't realize what Christ's baptism was. 
And Paul immediately baptized them. Uh, so the guys will be outside. The